Everybody is sitting down slowly. So we'll start. This is the uh, second panel or the first panel, depending on how we consider the previous one. Uh, my name is Fabio Parasecoli, and there are a few seats here and there. I can see it from here, maybe from the back where you're standing, you can't, but there are seats. Just be adventurous. All right, so I was saying, uh, I'm Fabio Parasecoli. I am a food, a professor of food studies at NYU. Um, I used to teach here, so it's sort of coming back. Uh, very glad to be invited to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, I'm just doing the, the general introduction and then we'll sit down and we'll, it, it's gonna be a, a conversation. So we have five panelists, all very interesting, very interesting work. So I will ask each of them to sort of introduce their own work and then we'll have a, a, a conversation all together. Here on my uh, left is Scott Alves Barton. Uh, he, is, he teaches uh, at NYU uh, in Queens College. He has a PhD in food studies from NYU. Um, he's worked for a long time as a chef, uh, as a consultant in the, in the food business, works a lot in Latin America, especially in Brazil. And uh, he works on video quite a bit, and so I'm, I'm really interested to hear what he has to say about the role of video in what we're discussing, because we've been talking about photographs, but what happened to the moving image? Uh, next to Scott, we have Marion Nessel, uh, Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health Emerita at uh, New York University. Probably she doesn't need much introduction, but we're going to talk about blogging with her because she's one of you know, the most visible bloggers in the uh, food sphere, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, what she has to say about that. Oh, and by the way, you have the complete bios in the program, so I'm just indicate who's who, basically, and you can read more information uh, in the program. Then we have Rosie Nelson. Uh, she's been a community manager on digital marketing team at the Union Square Hospitality Group. And so we'll talk about the role of that for the restaurant business. Uh, next, we have Aaron Hutchinson, uh, writer, editor, and recipe developer, uh, based here in New York. And he works for Robert Parker Wine Advocate and the Michelin Guide. So I'm really interested because having myself come out of that world of food critic and whatnot, I'm curious to see what's happening now. Uh, in that side of the business. And then uh, we have uh, Steven Schmidt, uh, the principal researcher and writer for the Manuscript Cookbook Survey, uh, which is a uh, foundation-supported web project uh, that is featuring online, an online database of pre-1865 English language manuscript cookbooks held in US public repositories. So it's gonna, um, he's going to talk about digital humanities and also how they interact with this uh, food writing. So I would ask Scott to, to start telling us what's the role of videos in this new uh, online environment and social media in particular. Hi, good, good morning. Um, so as, he, as Fabio said, I teach at NYU and Queens College, also Montclair State University in New Jersey. But at NYU, I teach in digital storytelling for food studies students that deals with current issues in food and politics, generally speaking, um, though I'm not going to talk about that right now. Um, so I have a brief statement that I'm going to uh, bookend with two short videos, um, thinking that that might be a way to talk about it. Um, so I think there are inherent uh, challenges and strengths to having video a as a way of story to narrative storytelling within food. But the problem that I see is the image requires context. And often we use the image as a signpost or a way to point something but not really give d deep context. And with some of my students, there sometimes is the ability to not do the rigorous research because I think the image is going to stand in for you. And particularly with younger students, millennials, et cetera. And of course, I had this all on my little phone and I cut myself off. Um, <laughs> the uh, use of devices is so prevalent that it can be a blessing and a curse. 
And so that is something I want to really stress. Um, because for many of them, and I have this, I have many of you might do have this problem in the classroom, I constantly have to have people stop using their phones. I've gone to the level of texting my students because I get that information <laughs> while they're on their phones and saying, you need to put that phone down, we're in class, okay? Um, <laughs> and so that said, you know, there, the idea of using visual media, particularly a video, one of the problems I see with millennials, et cetera, is that they don't have cognitive skills to critically analyze visual storytelling and look at the semiotics of it. And so to do that, you need to build a vocabulary and a new way of critical thinking where they're really understanding what images mean and the juxtaposition or the importance of certain uh, ideas or people or events or moments in a, a visual narrative. Um, the ubiquity is great and bad because it democratizes the, the, the environment. Everybody's picked it up. We can see with things like Rodney King, et cetera, that we get some stories we might not have get because they're new vectors, new stakeholders who have a, uh, an issue that they want to bring to the fore, and that can Im Im improve what we get to see as a body politic in the public sphere, and that's a good thing. Um, the, obviously, the, the negative can be clickbait and the viral phenomena where the food porn takes over and we don't really have any substance behind it other than the desire to eat that thing, which isn't inherently bad, but we need to have, I always want context. Um, and uh, I think Diane referenced this, depending on the platform, the actual so file size can inhibit the ability to tell a good story because visual media, particularly uh, video, takes a lot of uh, bits and bytes. And so you have to have a clipped message that can or cannot really tell the story you need to tell. And so these kinds of issues like technological narrative, I mean, the, the, the narrative at some times is subservient to the media platform and that becomes something we need to think about. And the transfer of data because when everybody gets online, what gets saved? You know, I lost my parents' photo albums. It's a longer story. That's something I can never re recover. But all of this stuff that's in clouds, what happens to it? Where does it go? So I'm going to show you two quick, uh, we were asked to have a brief intro. So I'm going to show you two quick videos. One that I've edited for the sake of this conference that you can see is Trevor Noah. And I guess what I'm going to foreground for context even though this is sort of humorous, it points to what I think we're, I'm wanting to stress. And one of the things that comes up is, don't forget Emmett Till. Well, I could talk through this one. The other one, I, you can see this is subtext. So this is in Brooklyn, and a woman said a man, a young boy of nine years old tried to sexually harass her and, and touch her inappropriately. They immediately called her corner store Carolyn, people in the crowd. And so Trevor Noah is saying, where are we that we've gotten to this sense that a nine-year-old is sexually assaulting a woman? And this other woman comes up, and they start calling her white woman. So a white woman says to a white woman, why are you doing this? Go away. And no, white lady, I won't. OK, white lady. <laughs> and this is all happening in a bodega, right? So this is where the food part is. And so <laughs> what ends up happening is, I guess the first white woman lives in this community. So she comes back to the bodega shortly thereafter and uh, the whole community has come out. And though you can't hear it, you will see in this second. Now I'm upset because the next one I really want sound for, but maybe because it's coming from another source, it'll be okay. So he's telling you the context. And so what he's saying to you now is this is the same scenario that happened with Emmett Till. And that Emmett Till lost his life in a candy store because somebody thought he spoke or whistled at them. And so now we go back to the end of the video where white woman one has there and now we see that the whole community has come out to videotape her so that it, it becomes a record that can be held by the community. Okay, that's one. The next one is much longer, but we're only gonna see the beginning, and if we don't have sound, it's gonna be a problem, and I don't know why we don't have sound. So just as a foreground, I was part of this, as some of you also know, you'll see if we get that far, Dara Goldstein, among others, that was uh, this memorial to Malaga that had been an island in Casco Bay near Portland, Maine, that had had a large African-American, not a big 
population, but the population was mostly African American at the beginning of the 20th century, some um, Portuguese and mixed race and indigenous, and they were evicted overnight. Uh, the women were put in, ins in insane asylums, which were new. If they had 18-year-old children or younger, they stayed with their mothers and may have lived and died there. The men were evicted from the state. So recently, the state has made a public apology. We're not getting sounds. I'm going to talk you through this. The state has made a public apology not too long ago, and a colleague of mine and friend, Myron Beasley, created a memorial that included archaeologists, food studies scholars, historians, park rangers, um, descendants, which is very complicated because the descendants visually read as white, but they're mixed race. And so some of them didn't want to participate, and at the point that they could talk about it, they um, often didn't want to come. And one person who is also of that, not a Malaga descendant, but a descendant of Native American and black, did speak. So really briefly, a uh, Bates College director of theater worked with a high school that's on the shoreline where the students who were you know, high school age theater students didn't really know this history, so the history got taught to them. And they got taught to them and they were also the waiters and waitresses in 19th century dress serving us. Um, a woman who has cooked for the likes of Obama cooked a 19th century meal on vintage chipped antique plates and they made this throughway to give us a sense of how people live there. This is the state senator and also a major organic gardener that he has a very nice speech I wanted you to hear that is basically, this was called repast and he is giving thanks to the ancestors and to the people who have lost their lives because of this and to the people who've come together for this day from various walks of life to be part of this event. And so this becomes something that's, I think, very productive as a way that video can tell a story. And I'm really sorry you don't have sound. I don't know why that's not the case. And just to say it as we're closing this, because I know I'm getting out of my time, they made a prototypical or archetypical house that ultimately, if we saw this whole thing, the students dismantle as a metaphor of the Malagites being evicted. Um, and as we sat there, um, they also had a poetry reading, somebody who has written a book about it. Um, they had uh, an African-American woman and an African woman, because Portland has a huge African community, do a cappella gospel and spiritual songs that were relevant and uh, resonant um, in addition to having this food. And then each of us, there were 47 of us, because those are the people at the island at the time, read out a name of somebody who was lost. And at one point, some of the descendants spoke their story. So since there's no sound, I don't know that I need to go much further, but you get a sense of this. Um, and so this, to me, is the hope. Um, but it, it, this has got incredible scholarship, research, and backstory to s support it. Thank you very much. I do think these are important points. Uh, we sometimes do not think how important these media are as sources of knowledge, not just for us as writers to produce something, but ways to know the world. So for instance, I have my students here in my class. I have them do visual ethnographies or also virtual ethnographies. See what sort of images float in the internet, what sort of discourses they generate, what sort of ideas, what sort of concept come out. So this sort of literacy, I think it's becoming more and more important. And it's important also for us if we want to have a presence on, on the internet as writers or commentators. And talking about commentators, I would ask uh, Marion, what about blogging? What's the role of blogging and above all, how do you use it in this sort of very heated uh, discussions in policy and this sort of debates? Well, thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, you can tell by looking at me that I'm not of the generation that does digital very easily. And with much sympathy to Scott, one of the reasons why I find it so difficult is it's really hard to make it work. It's just really, everybody, un everybody underestimates how difficult it is. Uh, we're very lucky at NYU to have fabulous tech support. I'm in the tech support office at least once a week. 
uh, with something. I know them all by name. The, um, I've been blogging since 2007. I was dragged into it kicking and screaming. I had just published a book called What to Eat, and Farrah Strauss, the publisher, was interested in trying to figure out how to use digital media, social media, to sell books. That was their goal. And they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. They said, if you will agree to blog and go on social media for six months, we'll build the website for you. That seemed like a pretty good deal. So I agreed to do it for six months, and it was very uncomfortable at first. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know what to do with it. The technical stuff was extremely difficult. The um, company that was managing the website was in Auckland, New Zealand, and I'm still working with them. Hey, it works. <laughs> They're fabulous. It works. Um, and at the end of six months, I kind of got it. And I got it in kind of a, oh, an unexpected way. As an academic, we are expected to do three things. We're expected to teach, we're expected to do research and publish that research, and we're expected to do community service. And I could see that the blog very nicely went under the heading of community service, because I was putting material up on my blog that was useful to students, or useful to in people interested in the same issues that I was. And I was using the blog as an electronic file system. What I was trying to do was to write about topics that interested me um, and to link to the original sources on it, to upload the documents, the original documents, so that I would have a digital space to, if I needed to look up something, the site has a terrific, it's WordPress, it's got a terrific search engine, I can find things in a second if I need to look them up. It's much easier than a file cabinet. And in fact, over the 12 years that I've been doing this, I've shifted almost entirely from filing pieces of paper in drawers, and I have 30 of them outside my office, um, to having an almost entirely online file system. So for an academic, it's useful. Is it useful to anybody else? Diane says she reads it. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> I have no idea who reads it. I have subscribers. There aren't that many. As far as I can tell, nobody's reading it. I don't hear very much about it. I used to have, here's, here, so that's the upside. The downside is that, um, I used to take comments on it because one of the things that they that the publisher wanted was some kind of interaction with readers, and that was supposed to be very important. Um, but I can't, could not. I discovered that I could not write. And I should say, I write books about food politics, uh, so I talk about the politics of food. And any time I wrote about genetically modified foods, the pro-GMO trolls came out. Um, in force, and the last time I took comments on my blog, I wrote something about some GMO thing, and I must have said something that set off the pro-GMO trolls, because usually I got two or three comments on my posts. I got 800 that day, and I had to shut it off. It was just, and they were so nasty, just so absolutely nasty, I shut it off. Um, I don't take ads on my blog, and I have to state my privilege. I was a tenured professor at NYU, uh, paid a salary, and that salary paid for teaching, research, public service. I didn't have to take ads. I write books about food industry, uh, influence on nutrition research and food research, and I didn't think, and I write, I didn't think I could get into a conflicted situation by taking ads, so I don't take ads. I've never taken ads. This is enormously privileged. Um, I had a salary. I didn't have to worry about whether I was making money from my um, blog or not. And I continue to do it because um, of its public service aspects and because it's so useful for me personally to have everything con connected in one place. And I don't spend very much time on it, even though I post five times a week. I spend about two hours a week in total. Um, by this time, I've got, I've got it down. Um, I also tweet. 
And that was, uh, that came about at about the same time because someone who was helping me with tech support said, you really ought to be on Twitter. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. Um, and he said, we'll make it easy for you. We'll set up your blog so it goes out automatically over Twitter. You won't have to do a thing. That was music to my ears. Um, and so I started letting my blog go out over Twitter. I eventually learned how to tweet and retweet. I don't use it very much. I, um, I look at it very casually. I try to look at it at least once a day, but I can't keep up with it. It's just too much. And there are things on Twitter that I find out about, particularly when people send, do messages to me and put my... Um, Marion Nessel on it, then I see what it is. I find it useful, um, but because, and I keep both the blog and Twitter totally professional. Food, if it's not about food politics, I don't tweet it, I don't blog about it. Um, and so it becomes very much part of my NYU activities. That's kind of unusual, but if you're an academic, it gives me an opportunity to say what I think without having to go through peer review, and I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marion. And it, it's interesting, I had a similar experience. I, I didn't have Instagram or Twitter. And then in 2014, I published this book on the history of food in Italy, and my publisher was flabbergasted. And the PR person forced me to open right there and then uh, the, the Instagram account and the Twitter account. But as an academic, it is a little complicated because how do you maintain a profile? The publisher wants you to have a persona that's not the same thing as being an academic, right? right? So there are interesting uh, conversations to be had about that. Um, Rosie, you work for one of the most visible restaurant groups here in the city, and we all know that chefs talk a lot about the, how uh, social media impact their work, but also I imagine social media impact the activity of a business group like the one you work for. How do you see this happening? What sort of impact social media have? Do business decisions uh, change depending also on the reaction of people? And we're talking a lot about the democratization of uh, the restaurant business because of the opportunity for everybody to say whatever they want. How is it uh, experienced on the opposite side? Yeah, I mean, just to give a little context, my position as a community manager is on the digital marketing team. There's six of us now on a larger marketing team, and we spend um, our time on social, on email, on websites, on, um, you know, basically everything on digital. And we're always listening to what people are saying. We're listening to what people's reviews are on social media across all of our digital touch points. Um, it really helps us improve. It helps us... Um, you know, all the feedback is helping us to change and to adapt and to, um, you know, listening to what people are saying, it really is impacting the decisions that we're making. Um, I can't necessarily speak for our chefs and for our restaurant teams, but our team basically functions to help the restaurant, the, re the teams in the businesses who are um, feeding off of this feedback, basically, and we're a pretty small team. We're consolidating all the information that we're learning across all digital touch points and we're, um, because we're a small team, we're seeing the patterns, we're able to see all of the consistencies that are happening um, across all of our businesses and, you know, um, share that and flag that for our teams who aren't necessarily seeing all of that and getting all that information that we are. Um, something that, that Danny has always said is that people are all wearing a sign that says, make me feel important. Um, <laughs> And that's happening both online and offline. It's our job and it's the restaurant team's job and it's our job to help the restaurant teams figure out what that sign means and what it means to make someone feel important because everyone feels important in a different way. Everybody wants to be heard, whether it's online or it's in, you know, in the businesses. Um, and feeling seen is something that we're always looking to, you know, feeling heard, I guess, on social media is what we're always working on. Um, something that, you know, USHG hospitality is basically wanting to have people come into our businesses and leave a little bit happier than when they came in. And our social media and our online presence is basically an extension of that, an extension of 
you know, listening to people, listening to their signs, hearing them and um, interacting with them. Um, we're always hiring for what we call 51 percenters, which means that 51 percent um, importance is put on the hospitality and the emotional aspect, and then 49% on the technical skills that someone has. And we sort of adopted that formula for our team where 51% of our time and our energy is spent on social listening and social engagement and hearing what people are saying. Um, and 49% um, is about content creation, basically. Um, Something that Danny is always telling us is that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, so we're always listening. <laughs> um, we're always listening to what people are saying. We're always looking to create that unique experience, whether it's on social media or actually in our businesses. Um, and you know, if someone has had, you know, we've we've let somebody down. We're always looking to write a next great chapter um, for them. We have, you know a bunch of really great examples of, of times that we've been able to listen to someone and actually you know, make them feel important. A really good example that we love to tell people about is this woman who had come into one of our businesses, um, Untitled, which is in the Whitney Museum. Um, at the time, they had fried fish lettuce wraps on the menu, and, they, and this woman had come in specifically for the fried fish lettuce wraps, and of course, that day, they were out of fried fish lettuce wraps. Um, and she made it known that she was upset and she tweeted about it. Um, and someone on our team was able to intercept that tweet because she had tagged us um, and you know, asked her to please come back in to, to Untitled to try the fried fish lettuce wraps again and you know, have a better experience. She came back in um, and we had told the Untitled team We'd given them that information, um, and they were able to create a specific menu for her that um, <laughs> in the section, that, or where it said fried fish lettuce wraps, it ended up saying Heather's fried fish lettuce wraps. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she then was over the moon and tweeted about it, Instagrammed about it, and ended up being a huge regular, not just at Untitled, but at all of our businesses, and she's constantly I don't know if she knows that we're hearing her, but she's <laughs> talking about us all the time. Um, and you know, we were only able to do that because we were we were listening because we were able to create that unique experience just for her. That's a, that's a fun story, actually. Thank you, Aaron. I'm I'm really interested to to, to hear what you have to say. You work for very authoritative sort of institutions: Robert Parker, Michelin. How's that changing? I mean, when I started working as a food critic, I worked in the print media. That gave us authority, but at the same time, that gave us a lot of responsibility. Our name was there. We could be sued for a label and lots of things that don't happen any longer. What is the role of this sort of institutional uh, website in a time where you know everybody can express their own opinion? So. Issues of judgment of taste, what's good, what's bad, that's, that's a big responsibility. Um, so with both Robert Parker, The Wine Advocate, and Michelin Guide, um, they are such legacy um, publications and so well respected, um, but it's a matter of keeping that relevance with the younger audience and newer audiences. So with The Wine Advocate, um, in terms of just their business and how they operate, it's all subscription-based. Um, that's how, primarily how they make money um, is. And so the role of digital and social media is to broaden that audience and hopefully get more subscribers. So with social side, um, that's something that I work on a lot is just putting our name out there, helping with awareness. Um, it all comes back to sort of what's the point of you being online? Um, why do you want to make money? How do you want to make money? Um, so on one hand, there's that aspect of just growing your audience so that hopefully they'll recognize what value you, you have to offer to them, and then they'll want to pay for that. Um, whereas with Michelin, um, I'm not an inspector. <laughs> First and foremost, that's something I have to say a lot. Um, but they are very new to the digital space. They just launched a website, which I work on, a year and a half ago 
where we go beyond the reviews that are uh, published once a year. So with that, again, it's about sort of getting more eyeballs to the name and to the brand and to grow that um, brand awareness and brand strength, um, which again goes back to how you're making money. I think sort of going back to the earlier conversation um, about how these bloggers and websites are making millions of dollars, um, the m sort of most traditional way is based on advertising. And with advertising, it's like every time an eyeball looks at an ad unit, you get a fraction of a cent. So the more eyeballs you get, the more money you get. Um, and that is the business of the internet, sort of in a nutshell, is how do I get the most eyeballs onto my page? And then from there, you can either just offer it for free, and their payment is looking at these ads, or you can offer it in a subscription model um, so that people will pay for your expertise because they're aware that I trust this person, or I trust this brand or this group, and that they have a, an opinion that I value and that is worth actual dollars. All right, thank you. Uh, Steven, let, tell us more about the project of this huge database and more in general, uh, what's the impact of the digital humanities on culinary culture and how does that interact with all the conversations we're having? Um, you know, as I was sitting here and we were saying, uh, who came up in the print world and who came up in the digital world. I, I of course, did come up in the print world, but uh, I have only been working in, on this particular project since uh, the digital world happened. And the project that I'm involved in is almost unimaginable in any other way. Uh, the, the digital humanities refers broadly to all of, the, all of the things that can be now done with humanities studies because there is cyberspace. And what the, I'm the pr principal writer and researcher for the Manuscript Cookbook Survey, uh, which is a foundation-supported uh, web project. And basically what that means is that I manage the site and supply most of the content. Not all, we do have a component of the site that I don't work on, but I supply most of the content. And um, our mission, primary mission, is to compile a, a database of all of the uh, manuscript cookbooks that are in public institutions in this country in English that were compiled before 1865. And I should perhaps just say a word here about what manuscript cookbooks are, because that might not be familiar to everyone. Uh, historically, when women, uh, mostly women, but also some men, collected recipes, the way they did it is they put them into bound notebooks, usually designated notebooks, but sometimes they wrote them in other notebooks that had served their function and they still had pages and they wrote their recipes in them. And uh, these vary in uh, sophistication. They, they, they vary in all kinds of ways. I can't really go into it uh, here. Uh, in this country, about a third of the ones that we have are actually English. Not too many of them came here with English people. They were mostly uh, bought, by, bought from booksellers. Uh, and a lot of the English ones are very grand, especially the 17th and 18th century ones. They were compiled in grand families and they are beautifully written by uh, professional scribes. Uh, there are a few of those in the American collections too, but, but fewer. M most of those are homier. They are mostly written by the same cookbook audience that bought cookbooks, which is to say, reasonably comfortable people, middle and upper middle and upper class people. Uh, so that's what manuscript cookbooks are. Historically, uh, they were always valued by culinary researchers. I think a lot of culinary researchers had somewhat romantic ideas about what was in them. I heard Barbara Wheaton make that comment at a conference once. Uh, they, 
they generally speaking show a, very, a fairly similar cuisine to what you see in printed cookbooks, but there are of course all kinds of interesting things in them. I don't mean to say there aren't, but they're not quite as radically different as I think people might think they are. Um, the problem with these cookbooks in terms of accessing them, one of them is that uh, when you go to a library catalog online, you, will, you can punch in any number of search terms. You may not find any of their manuscript cookbooks because they're under recipe book, they're under cookbook, the, they're under all kinds of things. And sometimes, in addition, they're not cataloged at all because a lot of libraries have a, you know, they have a backlog of <clears throat> archival materials. And if they're not used a great deal, uh, it takes a very long time to uh, catalog them. So the function that our site fills is that we have, we will someday, I hope soon, have all of them. And you can come to our site and you can see where they are. We link to the, to the library so you can see where the library is. You can even get directions to the library if you want directions to the library. Uh, and in many instances, of course, you don't have to go to the library because the manuscripts have been digitized and uh, in some instances transcribed. And you will see a link on our site to the digitized manuscript if it exists. We do, to some extent, support digitization uh, that's not what, really what we're about, but of course that's a great thing. And uh, we also, in the process of uploading these manuscripts into our database, if they are digitized and I can read them, then I can catalog them. And then the library is free to use our cataloging. Uh, now the Folger Shakespeare Library, if you go on Hamnet, which is their online catalog, you will see that all of their materials are linked to our site because the Folger really had not cataloged most of their materials very thoroughly. Uh, so in any case, you can see that all of this is uh, something that could only be done in, in, uh, digitally. To, uh, if you had to go to, if, if before in order to access these materials before, you would have to go to the libraries. Many of you here are probably have never seen a card catalog. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that's probably true. Uh, but if you had to go to every library and then fish through those card catalogs. And you know, archival materials very rarely even showed up in the card catalogs. Uh, this would be hopeless. And then meanwhile, you know, when, when I catalog some of these really interesting manuscripts, my descriptions of these manuscripts can run a thousand words. Uh, I might spend half a day just cataloging one. Now, if you were going to print a database like that, it would just, I mean, it would run to, to volumes and volumes and volumes, and then every time an institution bought new materials, how would you update this, this thing? Impossible. So, uh, in this case, it, it could only happen in the digital world. Uh, I will say just one other thing. We do have a, a what we call a blog. Uh, the blog, is, is actually very long essays of six, six to 7,000 words that I write over a period of weeks or months. The purpose of this is to, is to stimulate interest in these materials and to d disseminate information about them. This again is something that you could not have done in the print world because you would never have found enough outlets to to publish this material, uh, and of course, whoever might publish it has their own parameters. There's no reason to think they'd be particularly interested in whatever interests you or you think is important. So, uh, so that too, um, it, it, it can only happen in cyberspace. 
I could go on and on, but I think I've given you the idea. I just want to say one final quick word. This site is foundation supported, which is very nice, especially for me, uh, because I would never be able to do this on my own if it weren't. But if there are people in this room, and I hope there are, who would like to compile a database or who would like to start a site about a particular author or figure or topic that you are interested in, these sites are not hard to build. WordPress is a great platform. It's very easy to use. Uh, this is fairly accessible, not necessarily as your full-time job, but uh, it's something that anybody can do, and, and it's worth doing if you do it well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right, before starting with the question, I would like to launch a few general uh, reflections, and anybody in the panel is invited to respond. Uh, my, first, uh, my first question is definitely the online digital uh, environment is creating new expectations about what food is, what food uh, what food should look like, for instance. The images are very strong with, uh, for that. How do you think will be the long-term impact on how we eat, on how we think about food, how we speak about food? Is it just going to be something on the surface, or will, we ch will it change our, our way of looking at those things and our practices, our behaviors? Any ideas about this? Um, in terms of how things look in images, there are numerous instances of foods that are made just for Instagram, from all the rainbow bagels to the unicorn, whatever, and mermaid this and that. Um, <laughs> so there's what I call sort of um, fake food. Um, there's a proliferation of that throughout um, our dining culture. Um, that which um, I would like to see go away personally. Um, and, but Instagram and other um, image platforms have sort of made that a thing, whereas it didn't exist a decade or so ago. Um, in terms of how we talk about food, um, there are lots of discussions taking place now about the language we use to um, describe different people and their cultures and their food. Um, hopefully, there are, people are reading and listening and learning to those conversations of what people are talking about. Um, there are still a few um, prominent figures of um, the old food guard that may be more reticent to change um, and that are somewhat problematic in what they say and how we talk about food. but. Um, but certainly within the younger generation of food writers and bloggers, um, we are not standing up for it in, anymore. Um, we're putting our foot down and sort of helping in some way to make it um, more equitable for everyone and just being more respectful um, in how we talk about food and culture and people. I think I have this right. This uh, rest, a chef of the former Shaw restaurant, Kwame, Owunwachi was recently on Top Chef, and he wanted to do food that was based on African, West African traditions, and one of the things he did was fufu. And if I think about it, for many people who would look, they wouldn't know that dish that's very ubiquitous and central to West African culinary culture, and it brings to mind this idea of are you neophobic or neophiliac? Do you see something new and want to engage, or do you are you put off by it and keep it at a distance? And I'd like to believe that by this exposure and seeing the interest, and as many people have said, this driving people to a site suddenly makes that thing that could make you phobic more philiac and want to engage more readily to something you may not already or previously have known. I think this leads us to a very important topic, the access, who has a voice? Here, everybody of us has some sort of access and we can express our way of thinking, of looking at the world, but 
that's not actually the case, especially when it comes you know, to ethnic traditions or to minorities. And so how do you think that can, can play, especially, you know, you work in Brazil. Uh, how do people that don't have a voice get to get a presence? On, or they don't, which would constitute quite an, a problem. You know, proportionally, Brazilians are one of the highest users of social media on the planet. Um, it's one of the things that's really interesting and confusing in Brazil. On your smartphones, you could have as many as four different servers. So you only, I would only talk to Fabio, let's say, on my Verizon account and Marion on my um, uh, T-Mobile account, so, which is complicated. But if you can get online, they communicate because actually if they can get to a Wi-Fi hub, it's cheaper than using the actual phone to make a call. So there was a lot of pushback, for example, when I was doing my dissertation because I wanted to use social media in that way. And, and now it's more accepted, but then even a few years ago it wasn't because I have a lot of contact with people on issues of politics, religious persecution, uh, relative to food waste that comes up from the, what they call the um, uh, Nago network, the Aruba network, that's informal spreading of information. So I think it actually is something that's got a lot of po possibility. Great. So let's open it up. I'm sure you have plenty of questions for our speakers and I'll I, excuse me, I recently saw an article suggesting, we're actually saying, that some chefs were now changing their food for Instagram. And I'm very curious about that and uh, how prevalent that is and whether obviously it must affect taste as well as appearance. But that seems to me rather a huge thing for chefs to be working backwards so that people coming in to take pictures can have the most beautiful pictures possible. And uh, in terms of Danny Weiner and other such things, you see such things. Sorry, in terms of Danny Meyer's group and others such, have any of you encountered this? I mean, it really depends on the, on the business, it really depends on the food. There are initiatives that, um, you know, have sort of been the brainchild of our team. Like, um, if anyone's been to Daily Provisions, we have crawlers um, that are delicious, and um, they look good too, but we had a, a Pride campaign last year during the uh, NYC Pride Parade, um, and we created, or the Daily Provisions team created a rainbow crawler. Um, that obviously is really looks really great on photos. Also tastes really great, um, and it was a really successful campaign. And all the profits went towards NYC Pride. Um, so you know we we definitely capitalize on the fact that those are really photogenic. But um, none of our businesses are ever going to create something that doesn't <coughs> taste good. It's always going to be food first. Oh, I didn't mean to apply the dish. I didn't mean to imply the dish wouldn't taste good. It's just the idea that image is driving what, because of Instagram, that image is driving the appearance of the plate and maybe necessarily some changes in how a dish is composed. That's wildly crazy. Um, yes, there are certainly restaurants that have like Instagram tables where there's lighting setups no. and everything. Ah. So oh, that, yeah. yes. Yeah, so it, it is a thing. Um, for better or worse, most likely worse. Um, but Instagram is big business these days, and people with hundreds of thousands of followers, if they post a photo of your plate and it looks pretty, then they will see direct impact on their business. So yes, and beautiful food makes a difference. And Oh, oh, hold on. Hi. Yeah, they, so sales in matte plates are up in restaurants as opposed to glossy plates because they don't glare for yeah. your phone. Yeah, so it's like changed literally like everything from the way that you, like the second that you walk into a restaurant, there's probably something having to do with Instagram. And in the past couple of years, I've been doing research in Poland, which is a relatively new market when it comes to high-end restaurants, fine dining. 
definitely the way they design the dishes, not the, the content, the ingredients, or the recipes, but the way dishes are designed, uh, the tableware, the lighting design of the restaurants, the whole design of the restaurant is really thought about being, looking good on, on, on social media. And this is very interesting because basically uh, these new chefs have worked abroad for many years, they go back to Poland and they start their businesses and immediately they take on these visual styles that probably were not completely, let's say, local, but now they are important because they know that their dish can be seen, I don't know, in Taiwan. And so they have to keep up to that standard that now it's become quite, uh, quite e expected. Hi. Um uh, this is a question for Marion, actually, about um, uh, publishers wanting a persona of an academic writer. Um, I am working on a project with three scientists, academics, and I'm the food editor and recipe developer. Um, an academic press has shown interest in the project, but has now turned to me because my personality stands out at this stage. My question is how to nurture an academic's voice to be a writer. I mean, must you be a writer first? I mean, will it, will, I want uh, my role, part of my role is to nurture these scientists to be able to come through in this book. So I don't, have a more specific question than that, but just your experience. I assume there that you're talking about a book for the general public. Yes. Okay. So academics write articles for professional journals. These are done in a very formulaic way. They're extremely dry. They're written in passive voice. Um, you're not supposed to use I. You're not supposed to have personality. If you do, you have a lot of trouble getting published. I have can talk a lot about that. Um, and the uh, and in general, academic institutions historically in the previous eras have not wanted academics to be interfacing with the general public very much. You were supposed to write things for your peers that were very scholarly. Um, and people who wrote popular books, those don't count for promotion and tenure. That was certainly a, my professional, my academic degree is in molecular biology. And I can tell you that books don't count. What counts is articles in Cell or Nature or Science or one of the really important scientific journals. So people are coming up in a culture in which interfacing with the public is not expected unless you're lucky enough to be at a school like NYU and lucky enough to have figured out that food studies would be a fabulous way in order to have outreach to the public and that I could start writing about the kinds of things that really interested me in the context of food studies when it didn't work for a scientific field. So if they're writing for the general public, they either know how to do it or they don't. Do they want to? And if they want to, they get some editor to rewrite their stuff. That must be you. <laughs> <laughs> and how wonderful that you know how. Well, it depends on whether they let you or not. Um, and you know, at a school like NYU, which values, I mean, what, what are we? We're a, um, a private university in the public service, is how NYU f uh, vi visions, it's outrage, then this is part of, I mean, maybe if you tell them this is part of their community service. This goes under the, this isn't their research, this isn't their teaching, this goes under the heading of community service, and that's a way of packaging it that might be palatable to whatever departments they're in. A small addition, very often as an academic writing for the general public, I'm asked, why don't you talk about yourself? Put yourself out. And that makes me cringe. No. But at the same time, I had to learn how to do it in a way that makes sense for what I'm saying. So I'm not saying, you know, I got up, I'm in my sweats and I'm writing this morning. But there might be other elements that are more personal that can be relevant for what I'm writing. 
So maybe that could be a negotiation sort of a compromise uh, for people that don't feel very comfortable doing that. Thank you. I have one here and then I'm over to you. Okay. Um, this is a question for... Um, Oh, this is a question for Rose. Um, how do you, or, or maybe for more, um, going back to the previous discussion around the standards that are now international around how food looks and lighting and dishes, um, how do you strike the balance between kind of conforming to a standard and also just sort of the homogenization of taste so that like there still can be a unique voice that stands out, particularly on a visual sense. I didn't hear the end of the question. I didn't hear the end of the question. Sorry. Ah. Oh, just say it again. I mean, our chefs are always working on new recipes, new uh, new menu items, changing up the menu seasonally. Um, a lot of our businesses are, at, are around the Union Square Green Market, so the menu is changing based on the season. Um, a lot of our businesses have also been around for a really long time, and, um, you know, like, this is Gramercy Tavern's 25th year, um, and we're celebrating that by bringing back um, cocktails that people have loved throughout the years that have left the menu, um, but now they're coming back and they're surprising people and exciting people um, who loved them 25 years ago, um, or however many years ago throughout the years, and are coming back um, in 2019 to enjoy them now as a celebration of, its, of Gramercy Tavern's life, basically. I don't know if that answers the question necessarily. And also, I've noticed that this sort of international circulation of images, the standards of what things should look like, are also impacting the way people are cooking at home. You know, you invite people over, and I know, you know of people that get all nervous because, oh my God, how are my dishes going to look like? Are there going to be enough for my guests? And I found that quite interesting because home cooking is a completely different thing. It's not even a business. So why thinking like that? So just for fun, I use the, the hashtag on my Instagram. I use the Insta, uh, hashtag home cook and I put everything I cook even when it looks crap because it's like that's how food looks like at home. You're nourishing yourself and others. It's not supposed to be at the same level of beauty than a restaurant. But these images are so relevant that almost without thinking about it, we try to reach those standards, which doesn't make sense. So my question is for the gent uh, from Michelin, but for the panel in general. Uh, there are certain precognitive biases that are built into a system like Michelin that advantages some and at the expense of others. My question is, what's being done uh, on a practical level to decentralize uh, the, the, the entire culture of focusing on, on white maleness. Like, how do we get to the point where something besides that counts? So in terms of who gets stars and things like that, I'm not exactly qualified to talk about that because I don't, I'm not involved in that process at all. But in terms of who gets coverage on the website, that is what I do. Um, and I'm a black man and I want to hear stories that aren't being told all the time. Like, yes, we will write about the Thomas Kellers and we did a event or we're doing a video with Danny Meyer and things like that. But also I just published a piece about Melba Wilson recently who owns Melba's up in Harlem. Um, so I'm sorry I can't answer the first question about like who gets recognized by critics and the Michelin inspector team. But in terms of the um, editorial platform, like that is something that is very much on the top of my mind in terms of talking about people of color and women and all those who haven't traditionally been covered in the media. Um, so yes, I am working on one blog post at a time. I guess, thank y'all. Um, I had a question, or uh, one of the running themes has been sort of the blurring of the lines between academia and the public. And they're trolls, and there's always somebody that's not going to like something somebody says or a point. There is that. But I was also curious about with the public interaction 
um, kind of meeting the ivory tower, so to speak, more. Has anything positive come out of that in um, any of y'all's uh, work? Yeah. I mean, the whole point of what I, of my research is to try to get it out into the public, and this helps. Um, so the blog helps, the tweeting helps, the books help. Um, people, you know, I, even though I don't have a really clear sense of how many people are looking or how many, I mean, count the number of Twitter followers, but I don't know how many people are actually looking at at what happens, and I suppose there are ways of doing it, but I'm not very technologically savvy. But I've got ideas I want to get out there. Um, this is very valuable to me in terms of trying to do that. I can reach more people with a blog post than I can reach in years of speaking at meetings like this. So even though I don't have millions of followers by any means, um, it's if you're an academic who's working on something you want people to know about, that's how you do it these days. And how wonderful to have that opportunity. If I could add, the digital storytelling class I teach at NYU, one of the uh, factors of it is that it gets posted live. And so these undergraduate students are getting their voice out there about some issue that they're galvanized around to study and research that is, uh, in essence, a, vis um, a virtual book that has chapters that relate to their themes and topics they're interested in that suddenly, so to speak, they're de facto published. And they're talking about something that is important to them and having done some research about it and having text and video and photo to support it. All right, we might have time for one more question. Okay. Oh. Um, hi, um, first I just have a question. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the digital storytelling. Um, Scott, sorry, I'm sorry. I just Googled that and I couldn't find it. I would love to watch it later. Is, the, is it in private or something? Because I would. It is private. Um, it is private. Um, I'm happy to talk to my colleague Myron to see if I can release it. Um, okay. It is going to come out in a journal called Liminalities oh, soon. Oh, then I can wait. I mean, um, that's that, uh, going to be a, a special issue just on Malaga, which, uh, to say it, the, the piece I have in it has video and photo that supplements it because it's, it's an online performance studies okay. academic journal, and that's a, a good thing. And uh, private, like, it probably do it on a one-on-one -on -one with you. Okay, that would be great. And I, this is a, a question, I guess, almost for everybody, but I'm very... I do a little, you can almost not call it a blog, about local food. So you would call it mission-driven writing, you know, about any food, so little mini food politics, urban farming, gardening. So I've been thinking about ways to monetize it, literally. It's mostly hobby-based. But I'm very reluctant, maybe this is beyond the scope of this panel, but to just start taking ads or even, you know, authenticity being kind of important to kind of do other things that might draw followers. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, that maybe aren't necessarily organic. Um, so, especially, you know, Marion, you were saying that you got, drew a salary, so you were paid. And similarly, you're paid through the foundation, I assume, it's none of my business. But those are inherently privileged, yes. So if you're trying to do mission-driven writing that's not entirely academic, there's not really a way to get this same degree of followers and certainly not the way to get the same degree of ad revenue if you're not just willing to take any re ad revenue. And back and even things like pictures, I may do a disclaimer, I do as best as I can, but then I'm not going to do food waste. I'm not going to do 20 versions of something just to get a good picture. So I make sure that I do it as well as I can, but that's part of the story. Do you understand? Like, look at my food, it's I did it, like home cooking, yes. But I, I don't know if there's a real good question there, but are there opportunities, ways to actually get ad revenue, get followers that aren't the same as bots, trolls, buying followers, taking ads from any food company or any company whatsoever? And, you know, and you do have to have, and getting published by having those amount of followers. Is, does that make sense, that question? Okay. Yeah, for me it would be a conflict of interest and I just can't do it as a matter of policy. So, no ads. Um, I have a personal recipe blog where I do have ads on it. Um, and it's just like Google ads. 
It's not me going out and saying, or like companies coming to me is like, oh, it's this random pre-made frozen enchilada posting on my site. It's just, I don't choose it. I mean, you can go in and filter through certain types of ads, but that's an easy way if you don't want to necessarily have some company that you disagree with morally on your website. Um, but that's one of the easiest and best ways to make money other than if you were to create some sort of product, maybe an ebook. Um, I know a lot of bloggers do that, or it's going into like the event world and promotions and things like that. So, I mean, that's a whole different panel, though. The business of blogging. But. All right. Thank you very much. We'll stop here. We'll be around to continue the conversation. Thank you to all the panelists. This has been very interesting. Thank you.